On this edition of Natural Farming Systems in the South, Ken Dawson demonstrates innovative methods of integrating plastic into his organic farming system. He reveals diverse natural techniques that lead to a bountiful harvest. And he shows how additional workers help him to harvest and to market. One look at Maple Spring Gardens reveals two of the farm's most distinguishing traits, the extensive use of plastic culture and the extensive use of labor. We'll examine both of those topics in depth. But first, let's take a look at the extensive diversity in all aspects of production. This 61-acre organic farm near Chapel Hill, North Carolina, has come a long way since Ken Dawson purchased it in 1990. When we bought the farm, it was the back half of a worn-out, run-down tobacco farm. Uh, the soil was badly depleted, a lot of erosion. Uh, first year we had the place, we actually couldn't, couldn't find a single earthworm on the property. What we did was start building up the organic matter in the soil, and, and worms appeared and they began to reproduce. It's like the line from the movie, if, if you build it, they will come. Uh, if you provide a habitat for all the beneficial creatures, then, then they'll thrive and they'll multiply. The farm is now thriving thanks in part to a diverse organic farming system. The underlying principle of diversity really plays out in everything that goes on here. One aspect of that is the number of crops we grow. We grow about 80 different crops, uh, approximately 40 different varieties of uh, vegetables and another 40 or 50 different kinds of cut flowers. That gives us produce to harvest and market over a long period of the season. It spreads out our risk so that no matter what the weather is, is doing, it's, it's probably favorably uh, affecting some crops. So there, there's always a crop that's doing well no matter how extreme the weather gets. It spreads out our labor over the course of the season. The diversity of plant species that we grow also provides favorable habitat for a really diverse ecosystem, the insect populations. Uh, a lot of the cut flowers that we grow provide excellent habitat for the beneficial insects that help keep a lot of our pest insect problems in, in check. Even crops like radishes, for example, if we leave a few radishes in the bed unharvested and leave them there long enough to bloom, uh, they're a great attractor for beneficial insects. 97% of the insect species that might occur on a farm are actually beneficial or neutral. Quite often the 97% take care of the other three. One of the beneficial insects that Ken has attracted by the thousands is the lacewing. This is a lacewing egg. The adult lacewing is a nectar feeder. But the larva of this insect uh, feeds on small, soft-bodied insects such as aphids or the eggs of uh, tomato fruit worms. Everything we do affects everything else. It's a very integrated system. We plant cover crops to improve the soil, but many of those cover crops provide beneficial insect habitats. It's all integrated. At Maple Spring Gardens, many additional measures are taken to improve crop yields. A lot of people don't tie peppers up like this, but we've found that the amount of time and effort spent staking and tying the peppers pays off in the long run because they're a lot easier to pick. Deer are kept out of crops with fencing. This is what we call our electric peanut butter fence. We've got two electric fence wires here, one high and one low, two to three feet apart. The trick is to bait this thing with peanut butter so when the deer come along, instead of jumping over the fence, they come up and uh, have a little sample of the peanut butter, get a mild electric shock on the tongue. Doesn't really hurt them, but it scares them and they avoid the area after that. Uh, it's also very important to use a good hydrogenated oil peanut butter. The all natural stuff doesn't stick on the fence well. We eat the good peanut butter, but the, uh, the cheap stuff from the supermarket is the best for the fence. Drip irrigation makes efficient use of water and reduces plant fungal diseases, soil erosion, and weed growth. The connectors I've always used are just a straight connector from the header pipe into the tubing without shutoff valve. Uh, I've got lots of them around the farm. I've used them for years. They cost about 50 cents a piece. This one with a shutoff valve is about two dollars, but uh, it gives you an option that you don't have with the others. If you have a, a block of plants and uh, they're not all the same, you might not want to water each row the same, or one row might be finished and uh, finished its crop, and so you could shut that one off while still watering the others. Greenhouses and unheated hoop houses are used to add to the diversity of crops grown in the field. 
and to extend the growing season. Very nice fruit set. Good concentration of fruit there. Plastic mulch is also used to increase yields. It offers many of the benefits of organic mulch, like conserving soil moisture and suppressing weeds. While organic mulch has the advantage of feeding the soil as it decomposes, Ken says plastic mulch has one advantage over organic mulch. One benefit of the use of plastic is that in periods of heavy rain, your soil is not subject to the leaching effects uh, that you have on bare ground or with, uh, with an organic mulch. Nitrogen is very mobile in the soil. Even nitrogen supplied from organic sources can be leached out of the soil by uh, heavy rain. But with plastic on the ground, your, your source of nitrogen is secure under the plastic and you don't lose it. The drawback of plastic is dealing with it at the end of the season. When the plastic comes out of the field at the end of the season, it's covered with rotten tomatoes, it's dirty and, and doesn't present an attractive recyclable product. Uh, but if those details can be worked out, it, it'd be great. But not much plastic is used to get big results. The plastic that's used for mulch purposes is very thin. It's only one mil thick. We'll mulch about two acres uh, with, with plastic this year, and all of that could be compressed into a block uh, that's about one-third of a cubic yard. Prior to laying the plastic, uh, we prepare the soil as we would uh, for raising crops without plastic. If we have a cover crop growing, we till that in a couple weeks, two or three, four weeks in advance to allow that to decompose in the soil. And then close to the time of laying plastic, we'll go back in and shape the beds, till them, incorporate other soil amendments. The final step is to go through the field with the mulch laying machine. What we're doing is adding a second drip tape dispensing unit so we can put down two lines of irrigation tape on the bed. So we'll be preparing beds to plant three rows of flowers in. Three rows of flowers is too much to water off of one drip tape down the center of the bed. So the machine puts the drip tape down, it lays the plastic, it covers the edges. When we come out the end of the field, the bed is finished and ready for planting. It's almost universally a practice by conventional growers to gas the soil with methyl bromide while laying the plastic. The reason that's done is to kill weed seeds and disease organisms in the soil, but methyl bromide kills everything in the soil, which is completely counter to what we are trying to do as organic growers by building up a healthy ecosystem in the soil. We have been able to, to grow crops quite well on plastic without gas in the soil. Uh, we accomplish the, the purposes of preventing disease by rotation. Prior to having the machine to do this, it was a two-man operation. We would roll the roll of plastic down the bed a few feet at the time and stop with a shovel on either side and shovel dirt onto the edges of the plastic. It was a time-consuming, uh, back-breaking job, and it took two people to do it. Now I, I do all the mulch laying by myself. It's a lot quicker, it's a lot easier. We have a $2,000 piece of machinery to lay the plastic, and then when it comes time to plant, we have a, a pointed stick this is the stick we use for punching holes. Uh, we've got several of them made for different sizes, different size plants. Uh, this one is, is made to match up to the dimensions of this particular size root ball. We want to keep the hole in the plastic as small as possible and that minimizes the amount of space that's available to weeds to come through. And still quite a bit of water will run in these holes. Uh, it runs off the plastic down in the hole so it can get a good bit of advantage to rainwater coming in. Now on a hot sunny afternoon, it's a little warm under the white plastic. But it's a good 20, 25 degrees hotter under the black plastic. Early in the springtime that's beneficial, but not in July. At this time of year we'd rather have it a little cooler so the white is clearly better for hot weather. We have had experiences where, uh, before we started using white plastic, where we were planting late tomatoes in June on black plastic in 90 degree weather, and a lot of the tomato plants didn't survive the first three or four days. Uh, there was so much heat coming out from under the plastic. As the plants grow, they begin to shade the plastic, but they're very vulnerable when you first put them out there. Uh, we don't have that problem with white plastic at all. We can plant them in very hot weather on white plastic, and they do just fine. The straw is to mulch the spaces between the plastic, prevent weeds from coming up through in the middles. Uh, it also provides a nice clean surface when we're harvesting. Uh, we're not working in a muddy field if we have to harvest right after the rain. 
keeps the fruits clean. It also slows down the movement of water out of the field. When uh, rain falls on the plastic, all the water runs into the middles and will run out of the field. The straw slows it down so that more of the rain actually soaks in and penetrates the soil and works its way back into the root zone. Plastic does add to the cost of production. The cost of the plastic itself, which is uh, approximately two and a half cents per linear foot of row for the width plastic we use, that's for black plastic. White plastic runs almost twice as expensive as, as black plastic. The cost of the drip irrigation tape that goes under the plastic is about two cents a linear foot. And then, of course, the cost of the machinery to lay the plastic and the cost of the labor to take it out of the field at the end of the season. Thanks to plastic's increased crop output, the need for labor is increased. So. We use manpower, or woman power. The summer of 1990 was the first year that I had uh, hired labor outside the family. Our yearly sales totals now are approximately three times what they were at that time. During the summer months, uh, there will probably be six of us here. The number of workers varies by the season and by the day of the week. Ken assigns tasks and monitors progress. Zach and Alice, why don't you go ahead and pick the basil? We'll get that done first thing. The staff is a mix of veterans and new employees who learn on the job. All employees are expected to perform multiple tasks. The farm couldn't function without these folks who are working here with us. I can't do all the work anymore. It's, it's more than I can do, and it's more than my back is able to do at this, at this point in life. You so often hear uh, farmers saying, well, you can't, it's hard to get good help, it's hard to find labor, and I've been really blessed. Uh, every year I ha seem to have more young people calling me up looking for an opportunity to work on the farm here than I have jobs uh, for them to fill. There's a sustainable agriculture program at the local community college. Often students from that program are interested in working on the farm. The sunflowers are definitely dry, the zinnias, uh, the marigolds are still really wet, so I think you and Sarah can go ahead and start cutting flowers. And we pay our hard help an hourly wage. We have to deal with payroll taxes and so forth, just as any business would. We provide other benefits as well. We provide lunch for the help and, and access to produce to take home. But the benefits go beyond food and a paycheck. The folks that come and work here are not here just, just for a job, just for the hourly wage. They're here to learn something, whether it's about farming or, or, or life uh, in, it, in its various aspects. Uh, certainly, their, their labor is indispensable to me, but I, I like to think that the experience is a good one for them as well. I think the greatest thing that I've learned out here is satisfaction with things. Like when you work this hard and you get hungry, then eating is better. And when you work this hard and you get tired, then rest. When you live that way, then you're s your whole appreciation of life is better. Your life becomes richer. I think farming and gardening is one of the most important knowledges to have. Um, I think a lot of this world is losing that knowledge, and that's what you really need to survive is, is to be able to feed yourselves. Because we farm organically, I think we attract people who are specifically interested in working on an organic farm that uh, would not necessarily be interested in working on a conventional farm. This is organic farming, so it's good for the environment. Uh, I, I kind of think people should be moving towards that. I really like the basically slowing down, and I just like being around nature, too. you got this rotting plant at the top, but then out comes this beautiful little potato. And it's like gold, it's like finding treasure at the bottom of the plant. On harvest day, there is plenty of treasure to be found here. We spend a lot of time on Fridays uh, organizing produce for market. There, there's the initial phase of harvesting in the field, which typically goes on in the morning. We use an old milk truck for a, a cooler, and uh, we cut flowers several times a week and put them in the truck. Uh, most of the arranging of, of flower bouquets is done on Friday in preparation for market. Ken's wife, Libby, has another job during the week, but on Fridays and Saturdays, she is part of the Maple Spring Gardens workforce. In the morning, usually, I will do uh, the straight bunches, and we do anywhere between 50 to 300 of those. I mean, it just depends on the season. Things like carrots and beets, we wash them, we bunch them. A lot of time spent preparing the product. It comes out of the field in a raw state and uh, we prepare it to look presentable on the table at the farmer's market. Well, larger operations have a whole mechanized washing and packing line, but 
really unnecessary for the scale of things we're operating on. We get by quite well with our low-tech bathtub and drying table here. 90% of the harvest will be sold at farmer's markets. So Saturday is another labor-intensive day. I've been here for two hours, and uh, my two associates have been here for over an hour, so about, about four person hours in just in the setup. I think we're ready. No way I could set this up by myself or, or sell it all. It, it takes three of us to keep up with the customers. I love working here. This is, this is sacred work. While Ken and two hired hands stay busy at the Carborough Farmer's Market near Chapel Hill, Libby single-handedly holds down the fort at a smaller farmer's market in Durham. That was two forty-five. At this point, it's right on the edge of needing a second person, but I haven't. Um, I like doing it by myself, so I hustle and get it done. Ken also works solo after the farmer's market to distribute to interested restaurants. We really couldn't make the kind of income that we'd like to have if we were wholesaling everything we grew. The fact that we can sell uh, most of our product retail at the farmer's market makes it possible to make a good living on a small scale here. Like dill pickle size? It may be only a matter of time until more hired hands are helping aftermarket, during market.